why are you afraid to pursue your dreams or why do you only pursue them half-assedly? It's because of fear. It's this fear of failure. And that's the courage part. And you're, you might fail and you have to be okay with failing because you're probably going to learn something very valuable in the process. Hey folks, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Out and Back podcast presented by Gaia GPS. I'm your host, Andrew Baldwin, but I also go by my trail name Shanty, a nickname that I picked up during my 2019 southbound through hike of the Appalachian Trail. Now my through hike took me five months to complete, and during that time, I got only a glimpse of what it takes for the top outdoor athletes to achieve amazing feats of endurance and spirit. Now that I'm home, I'm interviewing some of these athletes to learn about what it really takes and what they plan to do next. We've got several amazing episodes lined up for you with the most unbelievably talented outdoor adventurers that we can find, and I can't wait to share them with you. That quote you heard at the beginning of the show is from today's guest, Heather Anderson. Heather, who also goes by her trail name of Anish, is, I think, the perfect person to help kick off our first episode. Anish has more than 30,000 miles of hiking under her boots. Now, for those of you who don't know what a triple crown is, that means you've hiked all three of the longest trails in the United States, the PCT, the AT, and the CDT. That's about 7,500 miles in total. Anish not only has a triple crown, she also has a triple triple crown, a calendar year triple crown, and she currently holds the record for the fastest known self-supported time on the PCT. So stay tuned, and we're going to talk with Heather to find out what motivates her, about post-trail depression and how she's handled it, about her book, Thirst, 2,600 Miles to Home, that tells the story of her PCT record-setting hike, and a whole heck of a lot more. So we hope you enjoy, and let's get started. All right. Joining me today is Heather Anderson, who also goes by the trail name Anish. We're so glad to have you on the podcast, Heather. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Heather, before we get started, I want to give our audience a quick rundown of some of your amazing accomplishments over the years. So let's see, you're a 2019 Nat Geo Adventurer of the Year. You're the first female to complete the calendar year Triple Crown, which is hiking the AT, the Pacific Crest Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail in a single calendar year. You're the first female to complete the triple, triple crown, which is doing all three of those trails three times each. Mm -hmm. um, you set the overall self-supported fastest known time on the PCT back in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. You set the overall self-supported fastest known time on the Appalachian Trail back in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, you set the female self-supported fastest known time on the Arizona Trail back in 2016. Um, that was actually overall, too. <laughs> Fastest overall self-supported yeah, fastest. They were they all three all. were, but the AZT and the AT have been broken since by men. So at the time you set the overall self-supported. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um you've done what, 14 through hikes uh since 2003, about 30,000 miles. I think that's the number. <laughs> I, I I think it's 14. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And let's see, you've done dozens of ultra marathons. You've done the Barkley mm -hmm. Marathon four times, I believe. And yes. then, of course, and then, of course, finally, you've recently released this awesome book called Thirst, 2600 Miles to Home, that chronicles your 2013 hike of the Pacific Crest Trail, where you broke the overall uh, self-supported fastest known time. But yeah. I mean, really, is that all you've done? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm pretty lazy, actually. It's not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, just kidding. I mean, it's yeah. amazing what you've done over the years. You know, you're you're an inspiration to so many people. And you're certainly an inspiration to me. I mean, I've, I've known your name since 2014, when my wife did her through hike of the Appalachian Trail. And I remember the name Heather Anderson coming up, and I remember just being in awe when I learned about <laughs> what you'd accomplished. And I was an even greater appreciation for that when I did my own through hike of the AT last year. And that took me 148 days going southbound. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine doing it. And, you know, what did, what did you do it? 54 days? 54, yeah. <laughs> 54. To, <laughs> amazing stuff. Yeah. It's, it's just so cool. So, yeah. but I mean, Let's talk about you. So it's just amazing. It's amazing what you've done. It's awesome. So let's talk about you and your background a bit. I guess I want to start with your trail name, Anish. So what does that mm -hmm. mean? It's short for Anishinaabe. 
which is the Native American peoples of the upper Midwest. I'm originally from Michigan, and my great-great-grandmother was Anishinaabe. So I named myself on my first through hike back in 2003, and I named myself uh, in honor of her. So that's awesome. where it came from. Uh, all the hikers refused to say Anishinaabe. They couldn't say it all, so it just got shortened to Anish. So I've been awesome. Anish ever since. So do most people call you Anish, or do they call you Heather in your everyday life? In my everyday life, I don't really have a lot of contact with hikers, so my family and stuff (laughs) call me Heather, Uh, but pretty much all my friends in the hiking community, they call me Anish on and off the trail. Awesome. Awesome. So Anish, you recently released your book called Mm -hmm. uh, Thirst, 2600 Miles to Home, talking about Mm -hmm. your fastest known time, your FKT of the Pacific Crest Trail, the PCT back in 2013. So obviously want to talk with you about the book a little bit. Don't want to give away too much because we want the (laughs) listeners to be able to check out the book, but again, still want to be able to talk about it. So can you give us a quick recap of how long was the PCT, the year you made uh, the unsupported attempt, and how fast did you have to go in order to set that FKT? The PCT is uh, twenty, a little over 2,600 miles long. I think it's 2,650. And I hiked it in 60 days. So, 60 I, days. Yeah. So I guess I think I averaged like about 44 miles a day or something like that. So. 44 miles a day. My gosh. What was your shortest day? I mean, did you take any off days? I didn't take any zeros. I think my shortest day was 38. It was, yeah, it was wow. either 36 or 38. You know, it was my shortest. Wow. What was your longest day? 54. And 54. I, yeah, I did a 54 and a 53. I think those are my two longest days. And was that in uh, Oregon or Southern Washington? Because I think uh, Oregon and Southern Washington are the fastest part of the trail, right? Mm, Southern Oregon's pretty fast. And I did basically right around 50 miles a day through there. But my actually my my longest day was the last day. Uh, And and that's the day I did 54 miles, uh, basically, because I wasn't stopping until I got to Canada. (laughs) (laughs) So... Yeah. But then even when you got to Canada, then isn't it like another seven or eight miles just to get out of there? Yeah, I camped a quarter of a mile into Canada that night and hiked out the next morning. It's an eight mile hike out. But there's an actual awesome. designated campground right basically at the border. So with uh, the idea of an FKT, and I guess this is something I want to clarify, there's different types of FKTs, right? Because we've been talking about mm-hmm. how you set the unsupported FKT. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, So there's three separate categories, and one is really a subcategory. So supported, which means you can have as much assistance as you want as long as you actually are performing the movement. So anything short of a piggyback ride, basically, you can have, Mm -hmm. and that's supported. And then unsupported means that you're fully self-contained and you have everything with you start to finish the entire uh, distance. So the self-supported, which is the category I've completed my FKTs in, is kind of a subcategory of unsupported because it's untenable to carry everything start to finish for 2,000 miles. Um, right. But I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a crew meeting me and anything like that. I was still mailing myself my boxes and I'm walking into and out of towns to pick the supplies up and things like that. So I was completely self-contained and self-reliant, although I did resupply along the way. Um, so that's the major difference between unsupported and self-supported. Okay. And so, yeah, that actually answered one of my questions. Did that, does that include like when you get to a road, you have to walk to town or is it like, can you get a hitch? Theoretically, you can hitch, uh, but the previous record holders on both the AT and the PCT had chosen to walk into and out of towns. So I also chose to walk into and out of towns. So there's a certain level of just following what's been done before. And then um, on the Arizona Trail, the previous people had, I believe, hitched. And then I walked into and out of towns. So I I set the precedent, I guess, to then walk in and out of towns for people in the future on the AZT, I guess. Um, <laughs> what was your uh, what was your longest uh, town walk um, for any of these FKTs? I think my longest one was five miles round trip. That was on okay. the PCT. It was two and a half miles one way off of the trail. I don't think I did anything longer on the Arizona. No, I know I didn't do anything longer on the Arizona trail. So, yeah, that was my longest one. 
So with the book, the book's um, talking not just about your actual tracking of your mileage and your push to actually break the record, you know, talking about it's your own internal competition. The book also is talking about so much more. It's talking about your childhood. It's talking about your insecurities, how you got into backpacking, your thoughts about how you never really saw yourself as an elite athlete before, and then a sense of spirituality towards nature. I think you really poured your soul into this book, and it's what makes the book so good. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, how would you describe the writing process for your book? You know, how difficult was it for you to be able to pour so much of yourself into this? It actually wasn't too difficult, which seems like a weird thing to say, I guess. And I mean, I wrote it in about six weeks of dedicated writing, which always amazes people too. But I think the the thing was like when I first got off of the PCT in 2013, it was it was almost a traumatic experience, you know, because it, it completely changed my opinion of myself and what I was capable of and my outlook on things. And um, so it was a very uh, huge paradigm shift. And then also, of course, anybody who's done a long distance hike is familiar with post hike depression. And the post hike depression that came with that hike was so much more intense because the hike itself had been more intense. And one of the main things I did to cope with that was I started journaling and I basically just sat down and started writing day one. And I basically wrote down the entire hike. I think I wrote all the way up until Oregon. And that was basically like how I processed the post hike depression and the experience is writing it out until like I felt like I had done what I needed to do to process it and move forward. So obviously I had these incredibly detailed journals uh, to draw off of, which helped expedite the writing process. But when I sat down, you know, five years later to finally actually write the book, I knew what I wanted to write. I knew the story I wanted to tell. And at that point it was just speaking my truth. And I think it's easy mm -hmm. to do that when you are committed to doing it. For me, it wasn't a challenge to put it down on paper because I had already made the decision that that was what I was going to write. And so it was pretty easy to just put the words down on paper and and put it out there um, once I committed yeah. to doing so. Yeah. And this is something I think that a lot of us can tie into. I know not all of us are out there doing uh, FKTs, but every year, I mean, you have thousands of people who are coming off their through hikes. I mean, do you have any advice for people on, you know, how to deal with reentry um, back into the quote unquote real world after a through hike? <laughs> you know, it's it's different for everyone. And I've learned different coping mechanisms over the years. You know, it used to be I would just start planning my next hike or my next adventure. And um, that does work and it works for a lot of people. And um, but I think over time, especially as I've gotten older, and I've done more hikes, you know, eventually at a certain point, you don't want to just launch into another hike. And so it's become more of a challenge to just sit with the the sadness and the grief. And I think the important thing to remember is that it's not just a, a form of depression, it's a form of grief. And you have to basically work through the stages of grief of losing that experience, you know, because you no longer are immersed in it. And just as grief looks different for everyone, when you lose somebody you love, it's going to look different for everyone when they have lost their trail experience and they have to synthesize it into their life as a memory instead of something active. And um, mm -hmm. so it really does vary for a lot of people. But I think the biggest thing that I think can be helpful is knowing that this is normal and it's common and almost every single through hiker goes through this. And for me, having lots of friends in the hiking community helps because they understand and you have somebody you can talk to. And and I think being there for others that, you know, who might be dealing with it is also something as those of us who've through hiked before can offer um, to new through hikers who may be going through this for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And actually that ties into something that, you know, I want to talk about, about being still in connection with the hiking community, talking with other hikers who are all dealing with the same thing. You know, we're in a very interesting, very challenging time right now that we're uh, having this conversation. Mm -hmm. I know it's it's hard out there for everyone right now, certainly the backpacking community, too. I mean, we've all been affected by coronavirus. We have mm -hmm. trail closures everywhere. We have tons of debate about, you know, 
the being able to do outdoor activity while being mindful of social distancing. Um, but I think it's really important that we talk with you about this, with you being one of the superstars of the community. Um, so I would say, um, you know, what are you doing to be able to stay in touch with others in the community as we're all kind of quarantined here? Well, one of the major benefits to being super introverted is that I already kept in touch with everyone via text and email. <laughs> so, <laughs> Introverts unite. Yes. And I think that is one advantage. I think amongst hikers, a lot of us are tend to be pretty introverted or if we're not introverted, we are used to going big chunks of time without interaction. And so I think we have had this uh, experience on the trail that also helps us navigate this shift a little more easily maybe than people who haven't ever had the experience of being say out in the wilderness alone for three weeks or whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've definitely checked in with a lot of my friends a lot more frequently during this. I think we all have. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good because just like dealing with that post hike depression is like, we can all commiserate about our loss of being able to be on the trail and we're all very independent and want to go out and hike and do our thing and being able to stay in touch with one another and, and support one another because we really can't. And I think most hikers don't like being told no. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I think that it's good to be able to be there for each other right now. I have, you know, a handful of my hiking friends that we check in probably every other day and are just like, this sucks. <laughs> like I want to go hiking, you know, no. and, uh, just being able to like, commiserate together really is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, have you had any big specific hiking trips this year that you've had to cancel because of it, or st are you still making plans for a little later this summer? So, um, most of my plans this year, my big plans, quote unquote, were scheduled for late summer and into the fall. And, so right now they're kind of just nebulously on hold because I don't want to continue planning them in case they don't happen. Um, but I haven't accepted that they might be fully canceled. Um, the biggest plan was like, we had a big international hiking trip planned for September. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't hold out a lot of hope that international travel is going to be viable this year yeah. at all <laughs> anywhere. Um, so you know, that I've kind of had to let go of, but the, the domestic hiking that I had in mind for this, um, this late summer, early fall, I'm hoping we'll still get to do, but, um, so I, luckily I wasn't planning a big, you know, a big all year hike that started in March and then that, you know, got canceled completely. So there is definitely still some hope that we'll get to do some of the things that we wanted to do this year, um, or at least come up with different things, um, once, travel is more available and trails are reopened. So we'll just see. Yeah. So what are you doing with your time then in the meantime to stay fit? I know it's like for me, having my gym closed is absolutely killing me. Having the rock gym is closed, you know? Mm. Um, so it's really tough to be able to stay fit and avoid the COVID-15, if you will. Right. <laughs> so what are you doing with your time to stay fit? Well, luckily for me, like I, I don't, I don't do the gym thing like in the winters or my kind of my cross training time. And it's, there's like an inch of snow outside right now. It's still winter here. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm still very much in my winter mode of training, which is like, I run about 40 miles a week and I, you know, I can still do that right now. And, uh, mm -hmm. I do a lot of yoga and strength training and indoors. Um, that's usually mm -hmm. my winter is to just do that kind of a uh, cross training. And so I've just been basically doing probably double the amount of, of yoga and cross training right now. Um, <laughs> so, cause I am ready to get outside, you know, when the weather is nicer, I'm ready to get out and do more. Luckily for us, you know, the, our public lands aren't closed down, closed down as long as you stay local. And we have a nice set of trails right across the street from where we live. So we get to go back there every day. So, um, it is nice and I do feel very blessed to have access to that. So I am still able to stay pretty active. And, um, I just went for my first, uh, long bike ride the other day. It was a whole 20 miles. And, um, but it's fun because one of our, our goals this year was actually to do a bike packing trip. And that's the only thing that so far has gotten 
cancel because we were supposed to do it in May, uh, Mm -hmm. end of April or beginning of May. So hopefully we'll do it later in the year sometime. Um, But I can still do the training, you know, because I don't know, I had the Huffy Cruiser with the back pedal brakes growing up. So I've never ridden like a real bike. (laughs) (laughs) And so like I've been training on my husband's like titanium alloy carbon vapor or like Ironman bicycle and i'm like i don't even have to pedal like it pedals itself like it's it's like pretty magical i feel like it's like i'm riding a unicorn or something so it's been (laughs) kind of fun to like do that um and play around with like a new sport and you know and it keeps me uh hopeful because it's like oh i'm doing this new thing and like we're gonna take it for like a multi-night ride at some point and um so that's kind of been helping keep my spirits up, I guess. It's not like all hope is lost. I have something that we'll be able to do at some point and kind of working toward it. So that keeps me awesome. motivated. Yeah. Do you ever see yourself getting, you know, I mean, have you ever seen yourself going towards a big like bike event, like a century ride or getting towards like triathlon or anything like that? I don't really have any interest in triathlon mainly because I'm terrified of the water. <laughs> I would probably <laughs> die. <laughs> um, but I do, I have always been kind of enamored with the long distance on a bike thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably just from the same thing that attracted me to hiking in the first place. You know, that sense of adventure and traveling long distances under human power. Uh, the thing with bicycling is, uh, you know, it's more complicated. I feel like running and hiking appeal to me because they're so simple. It's like a pair of shoes and a backpack and go you know like it's not, it, you can make it more complex but it also can be very simple and so mm-hmm. uh, my husband likes to cycle and so like I think that we ultimately had both always kind of talked about riding across the country like oh wouldn't it be fun but neither of us really likes to ride on roads so then last year I found out about the Great American Rail Trail which I don't know if you're familiar with but uh not too familiar with, unfortunately. Um, so, so it's uh, basically supposed to be a trans-American bike path um, on connecting all the rail trails because we have thousands of miles of rail trail in the country. So it goes mm-hmm. from uh, Seattle area and then it ends out, uh, I think, in D.C. Um, and so I found out about that and I was like, OK, I could get behind that because like rail trails are really nice. And like so I think maybe in the back of my head, like that's an ultimate goal. It's not complete yet, but. Someday I want to ride that. I think that would be really fun to do. And to I think that would be ultimate exploration. So um Awesome. But awesome. as of right now, I've only done one 20 mile bike ride. So we'll see. You know, like, well, might small need to steps, do you know. small steps. Might need to do a few more. <laughs> well, you went on your first what backpacking trip and when was when did you go on your first backpacking trip? What year? My first overnight was 2001. 2001. Okay. So 17 years later, you're already setting the triple, triple crown. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's small steps. Exactly. Yeah. Small steps. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, I want to go back to, I do want to talk a little bit more about coronavirus and, you know, maybe ha- having a good conversation, um, you know, with our, for our audience about that. But I actually want to go back um, to one of your more recent accomplishments, 2018, when you did two things. Um, you were able to complete the triple, triple crowns. So you did the Appalachian Trail, Continental Divide Trail, and Pacific Crest Trails three times each. And you were the first woman to do that, correct? Correct. Yeah. Awesome. But the other really cool thing I'm for 2018 was that you were, uh, again, I think the first woman to do the um, calendar year triple crown, if that's mm-hmm. what it's called. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's hiking the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail all within the span of a single calendar year. Correct. Yeah. (laughs) Which again, 148 days for me to hike the Appalachian Trail, and that's the shortest of the three. Right. (laughs) So that's amazing. So, so that means 2018. How how many total miles did you do that year? Um, probably 75 or 7600. I mean. The Connell Divide Trail varies, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I've hiked it three times and always I've done somewhere between 25 and 2700 miles. And then the AT and the PCT are relatively constant. So I didn't really keep track of my miles. I just knew I had to hike all three. And so, <laughs> you know, the I think the official total for like the complete 
uh, CDT route, which I don't know if anybody's ever hiked the whole official route. Um, that's like, it makes it 7,900 for the three trails. So I think it's a couple hundred miles shorter is uh, probably what I did. Um, wow. but yeah, so I did that in eight months and a few days. Eight months. So room to spare too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When the snow started falling, I was ready to be done. Well, that's the next thing. Like, is there a specific order of the hikes that you have to do based around snow? It, it might not be as much of an issue because, again, I know more about the Appalachian Trail because that's the one I've done. And I know for the Appalachian Trail, I think the main areas with snow you have to worry about are just the Smokies, the Whites and Northern Maine. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for the PCT and the CDT, it's got to be a completely different beast um, because you're dealing with such higher elevations. Um, so what what is the specific order you think for doing hikes around snow? Well, you know, everybody that's done the the calendar year triple crown has done done it slightly differently. I would say most people tend to favor ending with the Appalachian Trail. And mm -hmm. uh because as you said, you know, you really only have to worry about a few areas where um it's too treacherous to go through. Um I definitely had a lot of snow in Virginia when I was hiking through in March, but uh I could still go through it. Uh, as opposed to when I got up to Vermont and uh, it became just such a slog that it was, I mean, you could go through it, I guess, but it wasn't really, um, it was a good waste of energy to try to push through it. Um, so what I had planned prior to um, doing it was to flip flop all three trails, um, doing the Southern sections all first, and then going back and doing the Northern sections um, Southern, uh, California on the PCT definitely has high elevation peaks that get snow. Um, depending on your weather window, you can traverse them in the winter though, still. And, uh, mm -hmm. same with, uh, New Mexico on the CDT. And, uh, but then what I ended up doing actually was just hiking the AT, um, the majority of the AT and then going out and doing the whole PCT before finishing up the CDT and the, and the, and the rest of the AT. And I did that mainly because my husband, was finishing his triple crown on that year by hiking the PCT. And I wanted to hike the entire PCT with him northbound and have that classic experience. And I wanted that. To, I didn't want to be flip-flopping all over the place and only hiking with him some of the time and, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. Like I just wanted to have that be with him. So I constructed the rest of my calendar triple crown around his hike, basically. Awesome. So so that helps part and partly answer the question about like, you know, how you planned for something like that planned very well with good timing for it. But like, how did you even come up with that objective in the first place? Like, to me, I think it's that first step of I'm going to do all three of these trails in a single calendar year. Like, how do you come up with that objective? It just seems so crazy to me. So when I finished my very first through hike in 2003, which was the Appalachian Trail, and, you know, I went back home to Michigan to my parents' house, broke and um, tried to find a job. And I had gotten a hold of Backpacker Magazine. And this Backpacker Magazine ran a feature article about a man named Flying Brian Robinson. And Flying Brian Robinson, I believe it was in 2001, um, had hiked the calendar year Triple Crown. And he was the first person to do so. And keep in mind that I started my AT hike northbound from Georgia and didn't even know about the existence of the PCT and the CET until I was somewhere in Virginia. And wow. so a few months later, you know, I'm reading this article in Backpacker Magazine and I remember running down the stairs, waving the magazine like crazy <laughs> and yelling at my mom and like, mom, mom, I'm going to do this. You know, and she does still remember me, like come running into her sewing room, waving this magazine around and telling her how I was going to hike all these trails in one year. And um, and then, you know, I, I went on to just hike the trails and I thought that I would be content with just hiking all three of them independently. And, you know, 15 years later, then I was out hiking them all in one calendar year. Um, awesome. So, yeah, the inspiration really just came from that article about Brian. And that's the cool thing. Like it's, you have an idea of it, you have the inspiration to do it and you're going to go do it eventually. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. So, so here's a good one for you. 
What would you say of that entire calendar year of all three trails? What would you say your best single story was from that whole year? It could be like a, your biggest close call or like maybe the biggest single trouble incident you got to. What would you say your best story of that whole year was? Okay, it's really sappy, but it was literally on day. I will take sappy. <laughs> it was literally day one. Uh, my partner and I drove up to the parking lot up on Springer Mountain and we got there at like right before dark and it was this raging thunderstorm, like raining and wind and whatever. And I was like, whatever, I'm going to walk the mile out and back to Springer Mountain tonight so that I can just start from the parking lot in the morning. So we walked up to the mountain, you know, the point nine up to the summit and we mm -hmm. get there and it's, we're standing there in the pouring rain and he got down on one knee and proposed to me. Oh, and that wow. was the start of my calendar year. Triple crown was um, getting engaged. And so we oh, walked back God. in the pouring rain back to the car. And the next day I started my 7,000 whatever mile hike. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, I mean, did that? Well, actually, that makes me wonder, like, so your awesome husband proposes to you on the first day of your start of you going for the triple crown mm -hmm. uh, in the calendar year. Did that make it harder for you um, in that now you're engaged to this awesome guy and now you're going to be away from him for a huge amount of time doing that? Like, is it how lonely of an experience does that make it? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of messed up the whole experience. <laughs> um. But in the end, it worked out. But, you know, yeah, in, he was originally planning to kind of like crew me the first um, week or so of the AT. And then he was going to go do his own thing. And then we'd meet up again on the PCT and hike the PCT together. And, and then I'd go finish the CDT. And, you know, and that's not how it ended up happening at all. Because then, of course, we didn't really want to be apart. And so he left after the first two weeks or week and a half or whatever. And then like, I don't know, a week or so later, he was back. And then he ended up crewing me most of the way up the AT. And then we hiked the PCT together. And then he crewed me the entire CDT. So basically, wow. it ended up being that he gave up his entire year, which I definitely didn't ever expect him to do, um, to help me succeed at this goal. And also, like, we just didn't want to be apart. But it also, for me, um, there were a lot of days that I wanted to quit, not because of the hike, but because I was like, well, this is silly. Why am I out here doing this when we should be, like, planning our wedding and, like, you know, starting this new life together doing And I'm out here, like, hiking these trails for the third time. So there was a lot of back and forth in my in my head about that. Um, yeah. But in the end, you know, we were kind of in it together from the from day one, literally. <laughs> and uh so it was definitely a joint effort to complete it. Good on him. That's awesome. That's, yeah. I'm giving him literally a high five to yeah. uh, the camera phone right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's awesome. So with this triple crown, you know, and your FKTs, there's one other, you know, physical accomplishments that I want to be talking about with you. You've done a ton of ultra marathons. You've done hundred mile races. And the one um, that I really want to focus on is the Barkley marathon. I know you've mentioned that on your website before and, it, it seems to be a very unique hundred mile. It's a hundred mile mm -hmm. race, correct? It's it seems the to be one of the Theoretically, yes. It's probably longer <laughs> so what, than that, but. <laughs> so what's the idea of Barkley? Like, what's the race like? What it's, was it, what is it about? So it's an ultra marathon mashup with hide and seek, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um so it was started uh, quite a while ago, and the race director uh, got the idea from uh, a prisoner that escaped from uh, the prison that abuts Frozen Head State Park in Tennessee. And uh, they found him, I believe, three days later, and he was only like a mile from the prison. Like, I don't remember how far exactly, but he didn't make it very far, essentially. And... So the race director was like, oh, this, you know, that was kind of his impetus for creating this like uber challenging race. Like, well, how far could people make it in 60 hours out here in this terrain? And the race has just continued to evolve. Um, every time somebody finishes the race, the race director makes it harder and <laughs> changes the course to make it more difficult. And so it's it's definitely a very unique and underground type of type of race. It's become very popular in recent years. And, um, but the basic concept is you won't know the course until the night before you start. 
Uh, you don't know the race start time until an hour before when the race director blows a conch shell. And so you have an hour to be <laughs> at the starting line. And uh, the race starts when the race director lights a cigarette and you go out into the woods in search of books that are hidden at various locations that are described and marked on the map that you found or had access to the night before. So you're responsible for copying down your own version of that map and following the route. Um, so uh, hopefully you have decent copying skills because um, otherwise, <laughs> you know, who knows? Um, and then you have to be able to find these books in the woods and they're like hidden under rocks and in hollow trees and things like that. And you have to tear the page out that corresponds to your bib number for that lap and, you know, get all the way back around uh, within 13 hours, I believe it's 13 hours and a few minutes. And so anyway, uh, but he, yeah. And so it just changes and it's very hard. And at this point it's almost all off trail. Uh, there's very little actual trail. Um, so you're going straight up and down big muddy hillsides covered with saw briars. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's more, it's the type two fun. It you is. Know. It's, 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 uh, it's as much type two fun as you could possibly want. Yes. So how did you decide it was a good thing to do? Like looking at the Barkley Marathon and hearing about these stories and going, I'm going to go do that. Um, it's kind of like everything else in my life. I hear about it and I'm like, yeah, it sounds fun. I'll go give it a try. Um, I mean, I knew about it for a while, um, but after I set the PCT FKT, I was kind of like, well, clearly that wasn't hard enough because I didn't fail at that. So uh, what can I think of that would be harder? And I was like, oh, Barkley. And uh, so that started my my attempt at Barkley. And, uh, I kept going back year after year after year. So there's something really wrong with me. Um, <laughs> I went back four times. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's unique. It's interesting. Uh, the format is interesting. It's very challenging. Um, I think those are some of the things that really attracted me to it. Awesome. What would you say the difficult, like, I know they're two totally different things, like, comparing like i did an iron man back in 2016 and like when people say what well, was tougher the iron man or uh through hiking the at and it's like well they were tough in different ways so i might be a little hypocritical by asking this question but what would you say the difficulty of barkley is compared to the difficulty of like an fkt on a long trail yeah like you said i mean they're just completely different i would say that if i was allowed to approach barkley like an fkt where you just walk until you're tired you sleep you get up and you keep going and you just do it at your own pace without the time cutoffs and Barkley is far easier because you only have to go like a fraction of the distance um even though mm -hmm. the terrain is much tougher um but the the time factor makes it you know next to impossible to complete the the you know it's not a through hike you don't just get to go out there until you're done and so having that um makes it really really difficult um, but that said, you know, I'm always recovered from my attempts at Barkley within like a few weeks and it takes months to recover from an FKT on a 2000 mile long trail. So, um, they're just completely different, wow. you know, apples and oranges, but they're both very challenging. You know, I think three days of an FKT and three days out there, you know, 60 hours out there at Barkley are pretty comparable, you know, as far as yeah. like, if you were going to pare it down like that. Yeah. 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 I think that's a good way of describing it. Um, I want to come back to uh, what we were talking about before your calendar, your triple crown and talking about Barkley um, and something that we relate to about introspection and um, being able to be, have a good message for everybody for what's going on with coronavirus. Um, obviously, I follow you on Instagram because I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that on uh, your Instagram and from reading Thirst that introspection is very important to you. It's something that you focused on a lot whenever you're um, through hiking. And I think it's really part of any endurance sport. Like I like to do a lot of introspection too, and it's find it to be easier when I'm able to be in the middle of a long hike or if I'm mm -hmm. in the middle of doing a marathon or something like that. Um, so I think with everything that's been going on 
um, and how our world in some ways has been turned upside down by coronavirus, I think introspection can actually be a very good thing for everybody. It can help Mm -hmm. us in dealing with everything that's going on. So there were a couple posts that stuck out to me on your Instagram dealing with introspection. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your views on them. So I remember a I remember a post back in March where you were talking about remembering to be in the moment, to cherish the now. Um, I'm I'm probably paraphrasing a little bit, but it's important not to be lost in worrying about a future you can't predict or drowning in regret from the past. Um, Mm -hmm. This mindset, how does this relate to you and how did you develop this perspective about the importance of being in the now? Um. Well, I'm a grade A worrier. Like I, uh, I can worry better than anybody probably. (laughs) And this is not a good thing. (laughs) And I think that the, one of the greatest gifts I've gotten from through hiking and spending a lot of time in nature is it's helped me manage this, this natural tendency to worry and to see that things always work out. I mean, every through hiker knows the phrase, the trail provides, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and nature provides and, and, you know, being able to watch nature, especially like when I was on the calendar, triple crown and being out there in seasons I hadn't normally hiked in, you know, and, and witnessing that full shift from winter all the way through spring and summer and autumn and back into winter again. And, and really feeling immersed and connected. And that really helped me develop this, this real um, ability that when I'm out, you know, getting ahead of myself and getting buried in, in worry and, and caught up in, in all of that to, to remember that, you know, nature isn't in a hurry. Nature is on time. Nature isn't worrying about the future, you know, and that, you know, when we're out hiking, it's easier to take life one day at a time. And I think that's one of the reasons why we enjoy it so much as modern humans, we can step away from all of the busyness and the, and the to-do lists and the distractions of modern life and go walk and move at a speed that we're supposed to move at. And, you know, not be worried about things. We just take it as they come. And, and so that's something I've really taken from the trail and been able to synthesize into my daily life and, you know, Mm -hmm. um, being able to just focus on the here and now and, and, and remember to just take things one step at a time metaphorically as well in my daily life. And literally. Yeah. Yeah, Literally. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. And I, I think that's an important thing we can even take away now. I mean, this is my personal opinion on it, but um, I think it's something we can take now with everything that's going on with coronavirus. Like, we don't know for sure what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. um, But at the same time, that doesn't mean we can't enjoy the moment that we're in now and being Mm -hmm. able to make the most of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the future is uncontrollable. And and I think the thing, too, that the coronavirus specifically has really brought to my attention is a slight twist on on that whole concept of that right now we have this anxiety because we feel like, you know, nothing's guaranteed anymore. The health of our, our family and our friends is not guaranteed. Our own health isn't guaranteed. You know, the economy is not guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. And the slight twist I've taken from that when I when I sit and I meditate on you know, the things nature has taught me is it never was. And I think that's been really important for me to realize that none of this stuff was ever guaranteed. It was all things I took for granted. Um, And that's kind of that reverse side of worry is anxiety about the future, but also projecting the future, projecting a certainty of it. And so it's, it's probably been good for me to be able to take that step back and remind myself that nothing is ever guaranteed and to really try to stay in the present. Yeah, I think it's a good lesson for all of us. So Mm -hmm. Um, there was also a post I wanted to talk about from February. And um, I remember when I saw it, 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 uh, it it stuck out with me. It said, what would your life look like if you dared to follow your dreams? Um, Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things, again, from Thirst was how you talked about how you always had this dream, really this this goal, you wanted to break an athletic record. Um, Mm -hmm. And even though you you had a huge hill to overcome, metaphorically and literally, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you dared to follow that dream and you ultimately achieved it with your FKTs like the PCT, the AT, the Arizona Trail and, you know, of course, the calendar, your triple crown and getting the triple, mm-hmm. triple crown. I mean, 
you found the courage to chase those dreams. And I want to know more about that courage. Like, what drove you to be able to achieve like this? How did you find the courage to do it? You know, it's a probably a very complex set of factors. You know, I've always been a very driven person and very goal oriented. And, uh, you know, you kind of alluded to the fact that I had a lot of hills to overcome. You know, I didn't grow up active. You know, I didn't, I, I, I excelled academically. I did not excel athletically in any way, shape or form. I was just joking around with my sister and my niece today about how we all have the uncoordinated gene. And that's why I stick to running, you know, like you throw a ball (laughs) at me and I'm probably going to get smacked in the head with it. Like I just, you know, no coordination. And, um, it was definitely a lot worse when I was growing up. And so I just always felt that, you know, I was just this overweight, you know, unathletic kid. And so like the biggest, craziest pipe dream I could possibly have was that I would set an athletic record or go to the Olympics, you know, something big, you know, because it was so audaciously outside of my capacity. Um, that is like the perfect daydream, you know, it's like, Oh, I'll never achieve that, but it's fun to think about. Um, and yet somehow, you know, that probably just fed, you know, along with my, uh, deeply ingrained insecurities, these things fed themselves on each other and tied in with this internal drive, this goal orientedness. And, you know, I just reached a point in my life where I had to prove something to myself, like obviously going out and through hiking those trails in my early twenties. I mean, that's a huge athletic accomplishment in and of itself. It doesn't matter what speed you walk 2000 miles in, like that is a huge athletic endeavor. And it's, 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 Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time. I mean, I told people back then, you know, we're athletes, like this is, this is next level athlete stuff here. You know, like we are going to be out here, like walking 20 miles a day for months on end, you know, and yet for some reason that wasn't enough for me, it wasn't enough to overcome my own very deeply set, uh, self doubt and, um, conceived notions of myself. And so I think that the courage and the drive came Mm -hmm. from, a desire to overcome that and to break free of that. And, you know, I was willing to push myself really hard. It's like I had to be something really big to really once and for all prove Heather, you are adequate and good and capable and athletic. And, um, yeah. So. Awesome. So I guess I could say, is there any advice you can give for anyone who's not even like my first thought was first time through hikers, but I think like anyone, anyone who has a dream or a goal to achieve something, whether it's a through hike or anything else, um, do you have any advice to help people to chase those dreams, those goals? Yeah. So the thing that, you know, it's easy to think that you know, because I was, I've been successful that, um, it's, uh, well, of course, you know, why, why wouldn't she take these risks? She's successful or whatever. But the truth is, you know, when I left Campo and when I left Mount Katahdin, you know, every time I've started one of these things, I've been completely terrified and like convinced I was probably going to fail, you know? And so fear is like our natural response to a lot of things. And, and, sometimes it's very valid and important to listen to our sense of fear. Um, it's how we survived getting eaten by saber toothed tigers in our ancestral <laughs> history. Like it's yeah. important. But, it's important to have fear. It's yeah, normal to have fear. It is. But I think that a lot of times our fear of failure, um, it goes into overdrive, kind of like that anxiety and that worry about the future. And that's the thing that I think that I've learned to overcome. And that's the thing that I encourage people to analyze and to do. It's like, why are you afraid to pursue your dreams? Or why do you only pursue them half acidly? It's because of fear. It's this fear of failure. And that's the courage part. And you're, you might fail and you have to be okay with failing. Um, because you're probably going to learn something very valuable in the process. And so, yeah, my, my advice to people is that you have to be able to stand up to fear of failure and be all in. You have to take the the leap and be willing to pursue your dreams with everything you have and accept that, yes, you might fail, but failing isn't the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing that can happen is that you'll never know. And yeah, well, failure is not final. Exactly. Yes, exactly. 
Awesome. It's great stuff. Great stuff. So let's see, what is next? What can we expect from Anish in the future? <laughs> what are your future plans? Well, we're going to have to <laughs> wait and see when uh, we're allowed to go out and do things again. But uh, that is true. You know, so there's a lot of things I want to do um, this year. Like I said, we had planned some international travel and, you know, uh, a bike packing trip. Um the debut of Anish bikes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm really hoping that, um, we'll get to do some of that. Um, but I don't have any long stuff planned right now. Um, and it's good that I didn't have anything really long planned because this year wasn't the year for that. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll just see, <laughs> we'll see what happens. I'm hopeful there'll be some more adventures in the mountains this summer. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yes, um, fingers crossed for everyone. <laughs> Thirst was a good book, a great book. So I want to know, do you have any other books possibly in the works? I do, actually. So yeah, next spring uh, from Mountaineers Books will be my second book, uh, Mud, Rocks, and Blazes, Letting Go on the Appalachian Mud, Trail. So stay what's tuned. What's the name again? Sorry. More. Mud, what? Rocks, Blazes, Letting Go on the Appalachian Trail. Awesome. Awesome. So, All right. Well, I'm going to pre-sign up for yeah. that. So, <laughs> yes, yes, um, I will and actually, make announcements as it gets closer to publication for sure. Cool. And I actually wanted to ask about the Appalachian Trail. Um, you know, you still hold the overall self-supported record on the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, mm -hmm. I know your records have been broken on the Appalachian Trail and the Arizona Trail. Any desire to reclaim those titles, take another stab at them? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, when we were talking about FKTs at the very beginning, and I was talking about my my personal, um, they were for personal motivations. And the lessons I needed to learn, I learned, and it wasn't as much about the record. Um, so, of course, there's always a certain level of disappointment, you know, when somebody breaks your record. But uh, the reality was I didn't care as much as I thought I would, um, because I had realized, you know, the real purpose and behind like going out there and doing that was not for having a record. It was for the lessons I learned out there. And, um, Joe McConaughey absolutely destroyed my record on the AT. And like, I don't think I could even come close to, um, what he did out there. So, um, uh, the Arizona trail was, was fun. Um, I would probably hike the Arizona trail again, but I wouldn't want to do it fast. I'd want to do it very slow and, and poke around and do side trips. Cause there's actually so much interesting stuff in Arizona. Um, along there is the Arizona spent all of last winter in Arizona and I was stunned by how much there was just outside of Phoenix. Like I thought oh, yeah. Phoenix was just in the middle of the bowl and there was like nothing around it, but you had the superstition wilderness. You had the four mm -hmm. peaks wilderness. It was awesome up there. I couldn't believe it. So, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's awesome stuff. It's awesome stuff. So, well, thank you so much. Before we wrap this up, I, I always like to end this with asking three random hiker <laughs> questions for you. So okay. number one, what's your all time favorite trail food? Oh, all time favorite. Um, probably the thing that I'd never get tired of is cheese in some form. But that's not very exciting. <laughs> but cheese is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> don't understand yeah. that. <laughs> I would literally eat a whole block of cheese every day for lunch when I was on my southbound through hike, and oh, I yeah. think those were my exact words. People were like, "Isn't that gross?" I'm like, "No, it's cheese." <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So number two, what's your favorite piece of gear that you would never leave behind? Well, my sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my sleeping bag is my my lifeline so i don't die i'm very cold-blooded so <laughs> i can't imagine ever going without my sleeping bag i'll allow that that's a good one um and number three what's your luxury item when you go on trail my luxury item this last year to spin my pillow i finally got an inflatable pillow and it makes me very happy <laughs> awesome awesome cool three good answers i like it well thanks so much nish for joining us it's it's been truly a, pre a truly a pleasure i mean congratulations on all your success good luck thanks. in all your future endeavors and thanks for writing thirst i mean it was such a good introspection to what goes into a through hike and what just goes into being able to achieve a monumental physical record it's awesome stuff so thank you so much thank you 
Hope to talk yeah. to you again soon. Yeah, definitely. Wow. What an awesome talk. Our thanks again to Heather for being on the show. Now, you can follow Heather and her adventures by following her on Instagram at Anish Hikes, A-N-I-S-H, Hikes. Her website is www.anishhikes.wordpress.com. And of course, please be sure to check out her book, Thirst, 2600 Miles to Home. We'll make sure to leave links for her social media as well as a link for her book in our show notes. So again, our thanks to Heather and our thanks to you, everyone, for listening to the show. We really appreciate it. Now, we're going to be back in a couple weeks with our second show, where we're going to be catching up with Thomas Gathman, who you might know better by the names Jabba and Real Hiking Viking. I'm going to say straight up that our talk with Real Hiking Viking was the definition of a good time, so make sure to tune back in a couple weeks. In the meantime, if you like the show, please feel free to subscribe as well as leave a rating and review on iTunes. We would really appreciate it because it helps the show get noticed. Again, we hope you and your loved ones are all staying safe and healthy, and keep hanging in there, everyone. So for now, this is Shanty, and we'll see you next time on the Out and Back podcast presented by Gaia GPS. Take care, everyone. <laughs>